Good afternoon all. I am Dr. Sabnis. Me and Dr. Kodkani, we are going to conduct this session on high tibial osteotomy. It's a big topic with a lot of interesting discussions happening in recent literature and uh, knee preservation is on the rise everywhere. So this is going to be a very good session that we are doing. Uh, that talks from Dr. Sachin Tapaswi, myself, Dr. Kodkani, Dr. Mangal Pariyar and Dr. Bidin Saudri. So we are just waiting for two minutes for Dr. Tapaswi to arrive. I can see him. Yeah. So uh, he is going to talk on the present status of osteotomies around the knee and recent advances. Dr. Tapaswi. Thank you very much Bhushan and uh, thank you Pranjal, thank you organizers of YROC. I will be speaking today on modern knee osteotomy, basically giving just an insight into what the next couple of talks are to be. So essentially if you look at what we were and what we are, I think uh, pre-2000 era was all about performing this type of a commentary type of an osteotomy where we predominantly did <coughs> sorry, lateral closing wedge osteotomies for osteoarthritis based on simple weight bearing x-rays and use the calculation that one millimeter was one degree of correction. It was all visual and we had fixation with implants which were very flimsy and only plasters. What we ended up with was basically oblique joint lines and we tended to put the knee in valgus which then later on progressed and a lot of patients ended up with a valgus knee with a medial compartment osteoarthritis. So fast forward to 2023, where do we stand today? Essentially, the whole concept of modern osteotomy is all about joint preservations and we look at these three main indications, <coughs> which is predominantly malunited intraarticular fractures, neglected ligament disruptions and even medial compartment arthritis still stands today. We are trying to achieve good correction both in the coronal and the sagittal plane. The sagittal plane is something that we understand a lot more better now. And we want to try and realign any form of malalignment which is present in both of these planes to achieve a good stable function of our knee joint. So essentially modern osteotomy has uh, looked at four main indications which are besides the indications of the medial compartment arthritis. So we are looking at re uh, realigning the lower limb when we are trying to correct cartilage defects. And the reason being is that we need to restore normal alignment in when you are treating chondral lesions because if you do not align your limb and leave a malaligned limb and treat cartilage, it is going to fail which is something that we understand more and more now. Also what is important to understand is that we need to look at the osteotomy to help realign the limb in someone who has chronic ligament laxity. So whenever we are looking at x-rays like these, this is a 55 year old physician who had a valgus knee uh, in whom the deformity was essentially in the tibia. He presented following a chronic uh, MCL tear along with an ACL tear and these are his images. You can see that his MCL is lax, his meniscus is extruded and if you leave someone who is 55 with such type of a problem then I think it is a sure shot recipe that he is going to land up with an early knee replacement. And once you look at problems like these, you need to restore their knee stability back to normal and which is when what you want to do is that you want to realign the limb, reconstruct the ligaments so that his function can stay good and stable for the next couple of years and next decade so that um, you know he does not land up with early arthroplasty. So essentially again going back to the drawing board, you need to understand where the deformity is and he had a closing wedge osteotomy on the tibia along with a concomitant MCL, ACL reconstruction and meniscus repair to do everything for him to restore his normal stability and his normal function so that he achieves a good long term outcome. Similarly in the sagittal plane we are very well uh, versed now that if we have an increased slope of the tibia then it leads to attritional tear of the ACL and if there is a problem which is reversed it may lead to problems for the PCL. So we now on a lateral films will calculate the tibial slope and if there is an abnormal tibial slope we want to go ahead and plan our corrections with the help of software techniques and do an anterior closing wedge osteotomy which is something that uh, is extremely important for us to look in terms of uh, restoring the abnormal anterior tibial translation which allows for a good outcome. The meniscus if you repair it I think it is uh, again very critical to look at the uh, 
alignment. So here is someone with the radial tear of the medial meniscus with chondral wear, and you have to recreate his geometry and get everything properly aligned. And so is the same that holds true when we're looking at malunited tibial head fractures, which need to be restored again using the proper planning methods. And this particular lady here required um, combined restoration of her articular surface with a bone graft and recreation of her geometry using a lateral closing wedge. So to conclude, we need to have better understanding of deformity in today's world. Not all valgus is in the femur, not all varus is in the tibia. We have to correct where the deformity is and not land up with x-rays which, in which the limb looks straight, but everything is all over the place. Because if you have an abnormal joint line orientation, you have a higher chance of failure of your procedure. We need to recognize any form of sagittal plane deformities and these expanded indications for modern osteotomy pave the way for knee preservation is what we need to look into. Uh, after that uh, great talk, we'll just talk a bit about the basic surgical steps of a high tibial osteotomy and the short video presentation. I'll try and squeeze the whole osteotomy process of uh, normal 40, 35, 40 minutes into 7 minutes. So please bear with me. So um, the first thing before any osteotomy, before the patient comes to theater is a planning. So you get a good looking scanogram which is properly aligned with the patellar facing forward. And then you plan your deformity correction using any of the techniques you want to use. You can use a software planning, you can use paper paint planning, whichever way you should know before you take the patient to theater, what amount of correction you are going to do and which bone you are going to correct. So as, there will be a few tips when I, when I show the videos. So the first thing you do is draw your markings. So tibial tubercle, proximal and proximal end of the tibia, medial tibial plateau, the anterior shin line or the anterior tibial cortex and the posterior tibial cortex. That's the normal incision that you're going to take for your, uh, for your HTO as such. Uh, EUA normally shows a lot of correctability of the deformity and based on that you decide whether you need to release the MCL completely or partially depending on, depending on the severity of the deformity as such. So the incision is a straightforward straight line incision. There are people who do smaller incisions, there are people who do oblique incisions, I've even seen transverse incisions as well. But this makes it easy because you can convert it in, in future as and when the patient needs a total knee replacement. This can be included in the uh, same incision as such. So a standard incision to expose the medial side of the tibia. The dissection is fairly straightforward. You locate the, uh, the medial wall of the patellar tendon, you feel the pace fascia and then open it in a L-shaped manner such as this and all of us are very careful or very uh, accustomed uh, to peeling off the periosteum on the medial side and it literally peels off very easily. So in an L-shaped cut, just peel off the periosteum like you would on a fracture end and that is done all the way to the posterior end. Once you reach the posterior medial part of the tibia, you will get two layers of the pace fascia. The deeper layer is the MCL. You can see the MCL coming in picture there. Now, MCL can be released completely without any worry, but you, I usually believe in selective release of MCL. So the deformity is uncorrectable, you will need to do more release. The deformity is correctable, not whole MCL needs to be released. But that MCL is being released as we speak now using a cautery. And I'll rather than cutting it transversely, I like to release it vertically so it has more space to he peel back, uh, to heal back onto the peeled off area. This is the most important step during the whole surgery putting a big, nice, robust periosteum elevator and scratching the back of the tibia all the way to the lateral side. And you should be hitting the fibula head all the way down. So if you have done this, half of your worries of injuring neurovascular bundles are over and you're able to get to the back of the tibia really well. This is generally followed by placing a big homan on the back of the tibia. This is going to help you in preventing any injury to the neurovascular structures. That will stay during the surgery there. You can put the plate on top, make sure you got sufficient space for your osteotomy. There are various plates available now, so this is always a very useful step to mark where your osteotomy is going to be. That makes life much easier. Then you follow, then you put two parallel, guide, <coughs> parallel K wires or guide wires from medial to lateral, starting about 3.5 to 4 centimeters from the medial joint line, aiming for the lateral side fibula head. 
or you can go 1.5 centimeters from the lateral joint line. So exactly like that, as you can see, you have sufficient space for the plate to be fixed. And this is the reason you need to put the plate on before you start the osteotomy to make sure you got sufficient space for the osteotomy. Make sure that uh, your saw goes parallel to the K wires or the guide wires. I tend to bend the wires proximally and try and cut on the wire. So my blade is always hitting the wires and is being guided by the, uh, by the uh, K wires so that I'm not going in the joint or I'm not deviating away from my osteotomy uh, site that is, that is planned. So you can see the K wires going in fast. Okay. This is followed by a biplanar cut, which is about 100 degrees, 110 degrees uh, at an angle to the transverse cut. And that's elevating the patellar tendon up. And that is how a transverse cut, as uh, oblique cut is done. This is called proximal biplane. That's how you will get your osteotomy. Once you've done that, you need to stack in osteotomes, which will open the osteotomy in such a way that your hinge will raise, remain intact. And you can play with your osteotomy to see if you are able to maintain the hinge. Sometimes you put a hinge pin such as this and make sure that your hinge is intact and you're opening and closing the osteotomy and the vision without worrying about hinge breaking or uh, any untoward effect happening. If you've done a good job, you will see the osteotomy opening and closing nicely just by moving the foot like that. Then you put a laminar spreader, decide the amount of correction you want to do and check your alignment. Make sure you're on the lateral tibial spine. I'll take 30 seconds more lateral tibial spine, then you fix the plate as standard. So plate is fixed in a standard way. There are four screws proximally, four distally, and that's the end picture of your osteotomy fixed securely with a plate. And you can see the normal valgus, sorry. You can see the normal valgus alignment of the knee post osteotomy. That's the post-op x-ray and that's the patient six weeks down the line walking more or less comfortably without any issues as such. So that's Roughly how you can do HTO in 7 minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon. Now, uh, coming to dome osteotomy of tibia for treating uh, the tibia vara. Well, medial opening wedge osteotomy with an internal fixation device, as we've seen earlier, is the most commonly used option, and it's quite popular because it has a number of advantages no fibular osteotomy being required. It's quite a simple and straightforward procedure. Allows for a stable fixation, early mobilization, and if you need to alter the tibial slope for uh, managing the ligament deficiencies, that is possible using uh, this procedure. But it does have some drawbacks. We cannot alter the correction in the postoperative period. So whatever correction you've achieved intraoperatively, you need to accept it in the post-operative period that's irrespective of whether you've got it correct or not. The patellofemoral joint is not addressed too. For higher degrees of correction, you may need to vary your technique of the osteotomy. And if the graft, uh, the gap is too large, one may need to graft that gap. No rotational corrections are possible. Implant-related complications may occur, and if you need to do a graft harvesting, a hamstring graft, graft harvesting, uh, it would be difficult following uh, this fixation. There is always a risk of hinge fracture, delayed unions, non-unions. It's not a midline incision that we do the procedure through. And for larger corrections, there may be an issue with limb lengthening. So the dome osteotomy with the dome stabilizer overcomes all these drawbacks of the medial opening wedge osteotomy with an internal fixation device. So in our practice, it may be best to have both these options available at hand, as each of these would have a different set of best suited indications. The osteotomy selection could depend upon the degree of correction that we need to achieve. For larger degrees of correction, maybe a dome osteotomy is preferable. Those patients having patellofemoral symptoms, again, a dome osteotomy, since we can get the Mackey effect. Rotational corrections are possible with a dome osteotomy. But the patient's compliance with an external fixation device needs to be taken into consideration. For those patients having osteopenia, diabetes, or ligament deficiencies which we need to manage by increasing or decreasing the slope, one may opt for a medial opening wedge osteotomy. Now the dome osteotomy itself has a number of advantages. It can be done through a small midline incision. 
It is in the metaphyseal bone stock area of the tibia, so good chances of union. There is no limb length discrepancy. Rotational corrections are possible. There is no patellar infera since we mobilize these patients much faster and there is no distalization of the tuberosity. Antromedialization of the tuberosity is possible, so the patient gets relieved of his anterior knee pain. Much higher degrees of correction are possible and precise correction of angulation is possible because the fixator allows us to alter the correction even in the post-operative period. Now when we are considering a dome osteotomy, we see that the ACA of the osteotomy precisely coincides with the cora of the deformity of tibia and therefore post-operatively we do not get any secondary deformities. I prefer to fix this with this simple uniplanar bilateral fixator and this has been published in the American Journal of Knee Surgery. I call it the dome stabilizer. Uh, the dome stabilizer clamp has got uh, two blocks, the sliding block and the swivel block and each of these function independently and can be locked independently so as to get a static frame as and when necessary. As you can see the fixator is quite versatile and we can keep both the pins at an angle to each other both in the coronal plane as well as in the axial plane, much unlike your Chanli's clamps. And this is what allows us to get rotational corrections as well as post-operative alterations in correction. Now coming to the procedure itself, uh, that's the preoperative planning, that's the preoperative mechanical axis, post-operative mechanical axis, the ACA of the osteotomy, and therefore that is the degree of correction that we plan for. First, a fibular osteotomy is done with excision of a centimeter of fibula. The proximal pin is then passed just 5 millimeters below the subchondral bone parallel to the tibial plateau. This is done under CM guidance. The distal pin is then passed at the angle of predetermined correction, what we've done in a preoperative planning to the proximal pin. Uh, the midline incision, proximal end of tibia exposed and using this simple device, we can use multiple drill holes in a dome-shaped fashion in an anteroposterior direction proximal to the tibial tuberosity. Once that is done, we use a narrow 5 millimeter osteotome and just unite these holes together to complete the entire osteotomy. Acute correction is then achieved on table till both the pins are parallel to each other and we assume that the degree of correction we've uh, planned for is achieved. The external fixator is then applied with the lateral strut first in the compression mode and then the medial strut. As you can see, this osteotomy has a huge surface area for union and therefore union is not an issue. The fibula which is harvested is then split vertically into three and is grafted at the site of truncation and that is the final picture following the osteotomy. That's the immediate post-operative x-ray. Now in the post-operative period, one can do a scanogram and check for the degree of alignment that we've got. For any reason, if you've got an improper degree of correction as in this particular case, all we need to do is relieve the compression over the clamps. The side requiring distraction is then distracted first to disimpact the osteotomy and alter the degree of correction and then re-impact back again by compressing on either sides to achieve our final desired degree of correction. For example, in this case, you can see immediate post-operatively, this is an over-over correction despite both the pins being parallel to each other. But using the versatility of the fixator, we could still alter the correction in the post-operative period to get the precise degree of correction that we planned for. So we start with full range of motion by around day two or day three, and we ask the patient to full weight wear as early as possible. They are mobilized from the third day, and by two weeks, they usually would leave their walker and walk full weight wearing. By three weeks, they are climbing and descending stairs quite comfortably. They can sit comfortably cross-legged because the fixator is quite compact. Even wearing regular clothes is not difficult because again the fixator is compact. Here you can see there is a significant difference in this particular patient's gait following uh, the surgical procedure both on level walking as well as on stair climbing. That was his x-ray preoperatively, immediate post-operatively and x-ray at the final follow-up. So by around 10 weeks to 2 months, the, uh, the osteotomy unites and we remove the entire fixator so there are no implants post-operatively. So it's best to have both these options available at our hand since it covers a more wider range of indications and therefore we can ensure more better results to all our patients. Thank you all for your attention.
पांच पे घंटी मत बजा सेवन मिनट्स राइट सो सेम सेम मैसेज डिफरेंट टूल ऑल ऑफ अस टू डू एच टी ओ इन डिफरेंट वेज आर कन्विंस्ड दैट द लॉन्ग टर्म रिजल्ट ऑफ ऑफ एच टी ओ आर आर गुड वी वॉन्ट टू गेट वन एटी थ्री टू वन एटी सिक्स नाउ डेज एज अ टेंडेंसी टूवर्ड्स गोइंग टूवर्ड्स अ स्लाइटली लोअर नंबर बट वी वॉन्ट टू गेट इट एक्यूरेट एज फार एज पॉसिबल ना द क्वेश्चन इज हाउ एक्यूरेट इज द फ्रंटल एंड सैजल प्लेन करेक्शन विद एन ओपन वेज हाई टिबिल ऑस्टियोडोमी earlier in at least about 50% of the cases the mechanical axis was not in the exactly desired position so if you look at this uh, review by bemp the yellow shows you the targeted angle and the blue shows you what was the range of accuracy and what basically this graph shows is that though the targeted angle is narrow what they were able to achieve is fairly wide so you are not able to get it as accurate as you would like and what they said was the results of this review stress the importance of ongoing efforts to improve correction accuracy in modern hdo so here's a case i do largely fixator assisted or fixator hdos uh, but i do use the uh, plate and the biggest sort of issue i have is in terms of assuring the accuracy so this is the x ray on presentation with significant uh, varus we do the full length x ray planning with the miniachi method the green line is the future mechanical axis and the yellow angle that you see is the angle of correction intra op i check the alignment just as uh, everybody else checks with the alignment rod not the cautery cord applying axial pressure to simulate uh weight bearing aiming for the base of the lateral tibial spine but weight bearing changes alignment so on table i i had uh, a good alignment the moment this patient is weight bearing it's obvious that she is in excessive valgus patient is fine however many a time these patients are not very comfortable with the excessive valgus and the other issue is of over correction will there be lateral uh, wear or not and the problem is especially with this jlca when you have a jlca um, this is on the left you see a varus view on the right you see a valgus view that variation in the soft tissue tension is what creates uh, the trouble so i use a fixator a similar distal to tibial osteotomy but not complete same aiming for the tip of the fibula like all the others this is the difference between the uh, open wedge done with the tomo fix that is the blue line where there is a biplanar and the way i do it slightly below the tuberosity but still an oblique osteotomy and we get an osteotomy which is complete enough to manipulate easily but still the hinge is intact on the lateral side so that even the uh, fixator on the medial side is stable enough so paid the distraction begins after 7 days and usually it's completed in about 21 to 24 days a patient turns at about 1 mm per day and by the principles of uh, elizarov this gradually will correct that deformity so here's the pre op plan the angle of correction is 13 degrees Uh, the hka is 170 there are newer methods of taking the jlca into account and in this planning we've done that we've taken the jlca into account and by that we get 21 uh, days of distraction however after 21 days of distraction we find that the angle has the the femur has kind of tipped over and gone into extreme um, valgus that that is with a distraction of only 17 mm but because we have the fixator we are able to compress it because the, the fixator allows for adjustment so with 4 days of compression i am able to get the hka to the desired range of 185 to uh, 185.5 degrees right so post fixator removal the fixator was locked at 185 Uh, so similarly if it was under corrected we just have to do a few days of 
distraction more and we can always get into that ballpark of 183 to 186. Now if you look at the accuracy of correction, this is a paper by Bachal et al. where they were able to achieve the desired alignment in 84% of the knees. Okay, we are still not at 100% but this is uh, way beyond uh, that. Similarly, uh, we looked at our patients by one of my students from uh, JJ. We wanted to achieve this 183 to 186 and we were also able to achieve it 80%. Uh, we could go higher but there is there are some issues where sometimes we choose to go, uh, you know, more than the angle where the weight bearing axis uh, goes. So out of this, we had under correction in three patients and over correction in uh, another three patients. So in conclusion, my reason for using the fixator is because for me the fixator allows for practically infinite uh, adjustment after the surgery in a weight bearing position because I can do that full weight bearing position at the end of that correction and see what exactly is happening. Happening, And for me it's, it's a question of 80% accuracy uh, versus 50% uh, accuracy and till now whatever we know is that the accuracy is equal to longevity of the result. Thank you. That is a great talk, Dr. Pariyar. Now I call upon Dr. Milin Chaudhary. What you have seen is all basic osteotomy. Let's go into the domain of complex osteotomies around the knee. And uh, Dr. Chaudhary is an expert in that. Hi, good evening, uh, Mr. Chairperson, Bhushan and Sachin, and uh, teachers in the hall, Ram and Professor Modi. Thank you very much for your kind invitation and having me participate in this session. We are going to look at some of the newer concepts and a little, you know, deeper into, delve deeper into high tibial osteotomy. 90 to 100 percent of the literature is on open wedge high tibial osteotomies, as you may have seen in some domes. But medial compartment osteoarthritis comes in different shapes and sizes, more deformities, gradually increasing. When you look at the mechanical axis, there's more and more deviations. So therefore, the question to ask, can one osteotomy cure all? We evaluate the deformities with the MPTA, MLDFA, JLCA, CPA and also we need to evaluate leg length discrepancy and limb rotation. So one HTO cannot solve all these problems without creating new ones. We've been trying six different osteotomies for the last 31 years and based during the COVID period of more than 15,000 measurements, we've come up with this algorithm that I'll share with you. You choose the HTO based on the location and severity of the deformity. You break them up into tibial, femoral, intra-articular or hidden. The tibial deformity may be small, which is when your medial opening wedge or a closing wedge is appropriate. If it's a small deformity, but there is an intra-articular component, you do the TCVO. If it's a large tibial deformity, you can do the focal dome if it doesn't have an intra-articular component. Humoral deformity well beyond 90 to 93 degrees is really when you should be thinking about DFO. And you choose it only in those cases. Now the intra-articular deformity, I'll come to it briefly, could be in the sagittal or the coronal plane. If it's in the sagittal plane, you do the focal dome, you know, the... Um, and if it's a hidden deformity like the length and rotation is when you add the focal dome deformity. So this is the entire algorithm and based on that we are going to now look at complex deformities. The postulate till to date has been only alignment is most important. But what the mind doesn't know, the eye cannot see. Well obviously what the eye can see is this lateral thrust and this sort of mediolateral laxity which can be recorded under the C-arm. So this is a sure giveaway for an intra-articular deformity. There are some studies that led to this understanding. The first study we did with four observers, 118 limbs, and we broke up the mechanical axis into greater than or less than 10 percent of joint width. And what we found is that larger deformities correlated well with a high JLCA. In the second study, done after three years after the first, 141 limbs, we broke up 
we kept mechanical axis deviation at 0% and half of them were more than 0, half were less than 0, which are severe. And we found that the larger deformity is correlated with CPA, the condylar plateau angle, which tells you that the two condyles are not collinear. So we have to give credit to Sukasa Teromoto and his team, which started in Nagasaki with Professor Chiba, who discovered the tibial condylar valgus osteotomy. The literature on this is scarce. We had the privilege of hosting his article in the JLLR in the year 2015. And there are just a few more articles in English. The principle of the TCVO is as follows. It is based on a high JLCA and a CPA. There is a teeter-totter and a point contact of the medial condyle. So the contact area is reduced. So first we elevate the condyle that reduces the teeter-totter. It broadens the surface area and therefore gives relief from pain. But the mechanical axis may not cross 50%. So here are some examples. This lady in her mid-50s like so, and her mechanical, the joint becomes congruous. The end point of this surgery is when there's no more medial lateral laxity, and the lateral and the medial tibial condyles make simultaneous contact with the medial and lateral femoral condyles. So this is the intra-articular, this is how it looks when it heals. A very brief look at the surgical technique. Large incision, patellar retinacular releases. This is um, very careful drilling of the posterior cortex and cutting of the posterior cortex, and very careful bare entry into the intercondylar area, obviously done gingerly and with great care. And then we elevate the medial condyle, like so, we ensure it doesn't spread apart too much, till both of the condyles make simultaneous contact. And then we plate it. Just a couple of look at some of these deformities. This lady came to us with this horrendous inability to walk more than a couple of feet, and these are her deformities in both the planes. On the right side, she had no medial lateral laxity. So therefore, she got a fixator-assisted plating of her dome. It's an extra-articular osteotomy in which we corrected the FFD by reducing the slope, by increasing the PPTA. Then on the right side, she gets this PCVO surgery. At the end of both of these, she can walk very nicely and for any number of kilometers and has no pain whatsoever. Similarly, an elderly lady like so, just the TCVO doesn't correct beyond neutral. So we are worried about the undercorrection, and we decide to add a second osteotomy. When do you add the second? There are many formulae for this. The alpha 60 is the angle that you need to correct the mechanical axis to the Fujisawa. That may be alpha 62 or alpha 60, or you choose alpha 55 or alpha 54. You have to choose the alignment. So it's not one size, one alignment fits all. And then you do your varus and valgus JLCA. The varus JLCA is positive sign. The valgus JLCA is a negative sign. So varus plus valgus multiplied by 1.5. And if this angle beta is, you know, greater than, then you need a second osteotomy, okay? That's when you do it. So we tried multiple things. We, we added a second closing wedge osteotomy in the same plate. Does manage to correct reasonably well in this lady. This is what we did in the second instance. It doesn't look beautiful, but she has zero pain six years down the line. And then we chose to add, this is what somebody Kuwashima wrote. We add a second osteotomy like this, but it doesn't work well. So if you're really stuck on alignment, then we can't afford to correct, undercorrect the mechanical, mechanical axis. And this align animation shows what we do is first we open the joint, we correct the joint, and it gives us up to 45. And then what we do is we add a you know, a second osteotomy below this with the fixator, a nice dome osteotomy which enables you to correct to your heart's extent like so. And somebody with this lateral thrust and large deformity with the pagoda tibia, you can correct this very nicely, stop when you want, watch them walking until you are very satisfied that, you know, you've hit the target both with the intra-articular as well as the extra-articular osteotomies, like so. So, now, we got good results with the JLCA, with the CPA, and the mechanical axis with the combined osteotomies. But uh, I'll wind up rather soon. Yeah, so the theorem is that, remember, primary theorem is that congruent contact of the bony ends and instability. So there's a different theory going along, and it's no longer just alignment. You have to understand that is instability of the joint. And if you look for it, you'll find it more and more and more in most of your patients. 
So the TCVO alone modestly corrects the mechanical axis, adequately corrects the intraarticular you know, elements like the CPA and JLCA, and, but doesn't overcorrect the MPTA. You don't want to go beyond 95 degrees MPTA. Okay, and it doesn't correct your tertiary deformities, and it doesn't correct beyond 50%. So when you add the extra articular with a fixator like this, I, I could go up to almost 60% as a mean and correct this. And you could also correct rotation from the distal osteotomy. You can correct length, which I have done in several instances. We have shortened some TBA along with an intraarticular correction. And now, what if you want to have your cake and eat it too? Here comes focal dome condylar osteotomy. An elegant two-in-one option came from Kanazawa City, again Japan. Professor Suchia, Igarashi and Suchia. Here, the osteotomy is a little different. The vertical limb of the osteotomy is lateral to the patellar ligament. And then you correct it in such a way that through the single osteotomy, you are able to correct both the intraarticular and the extraarticular components. 72-year-old physician with a large mechanic, minus 5 MAD, and this, you know, the, she needs a 16-degree correction, so she's not a candidate for an opening wedge. And now I don't want to do a fixator for a 72-year-old. This is a varus valgus JLCA. So, you know, the 12 degrees is, you know, lesser than the 16, so she needs a second osteotomy. So these are the steps. I always do a patellofemoral retinacular release. This is a simple jig. The first vertical cut is outlined, then is the semicircular cut. You use these lateral cortex protection wires because you're too darn close to the lateral cortex. Yeah, you know, with your your heart in your mouth, you do this sometimes so that you don't fracture it and then you create this osteotomy to give a good correction. No deviation, gross deviation of the joint line as well as a good correction. In a similar case like this, you can see how nicely there is a congruent contact at the osteotomy site as well. It was written up in JLLR, the first 10 cases, we have now crossed 20 and there's exciting times ahead. Thank you again very much for your kind invitation. Uh, very interesting and very complicated talk. Thank you. <laughs> any questions from the floor? Anyone wants to ask any questions? I'm Dr. Jetwa from Ahmedabad. Uh, I want to ask about the consideration of the flexion deformity. Patient is having a fixed flexion deformity of 10 degree. What will it change when you go for a upper tibial osteotomy? And is the calculation changes, or you do not give attention to that, or is the both cases similar? One case is having no fixed flexion deformity, other is having. That is the first question. And the second question that do we know by now why so many patients are having a severe tibia vara? A virus deformity, they don't get arthritis. Is there anything which is explained in literature? Tibia vara without uh, osteoarthritis, I think, is a question of time. Uh, there are patients who will get it by 35, uh, 45, and there are patients who will get it by the age of 70, which is isolated medial compartment um, arthritis. But I think all patients, there, there was a study long ago which showed that 98% of patients with virus, once they develop arthritic changes, will continue to uh, progress. So yes, you don't need to do a necessarily a prophylactic correction. I mean, there are younger patients, we will do it for cosmetic reasons. But other patients, uh, you don't need to do it until and unless they develop pain. Second question was, uh, what do you do when there is a flexion deformity? I think all of us will try to correct that flexion deformity. There is a bunch of patients who with therapy will improve their flexion. Okay, so the amount of flexion that you need to dial in into your correction will be less. My point is like when we correct varus, yes. we go from medial to lateral. Yes. When we correct flexion deformity by some sort of a uh, recurvatum, yes. we shift weight from posterior to anterior. No, we, yeah. But we are not, we are not, we, we can, at the most, we can level the uh, plateau. From an 80 degree slope, we can make it up to 
90. Uh, I know there are people who will who will go into this. I don't agree with that because uh, the, you talk an, of an oblique joint line in terms of the coronal and say that the oblique joint line can cause shear and therefore problem. Similarly, if you cause recurvatum in the sagittal, it can slide forward or slide backward. More slope, it will slide back. Recurvatum, it will slide forward. So, if you have to correct your uh, thing slope with an osteotomy, I think you have to go to, to uh, 90 degrees on the tibia and the remaining has to be done femoral. Uh, may I just add to that? Uh, there's one more point you need to consider for this flexion deformity is intraarticular osteophytes. Sometimes you have these anvil osteophytes inside which would block your extension. So more often than not, we always perform an arthroscopy. Uh, excise the osteophyte and you would get certain amount of extension. At times, ACL mucoid degenerations also would cause flexion deformities. So treating that part of it would again negate the deformity. Third point is when you're doing a postromedial release, that itself would add to getting the extension to some extent. In addition to that, of course, you adjust the flexion deformity in the osteotomy. See, um, in, in, sorry. Yeah, go on. Ram, after you, we'll ask. Okay. So, in this varus correction, we are correcting in the AP direction. I feel that it's a three-dimensional deformity of tibia varus. I mean, we don't make any special efforts to correct that rotation. That's the reason why I find that some of the HTOs or which have been done from the media side, they have done exceptionally well, but some of them don't do as well as others. So, is it the rotational component that we are not looking at, which we are trying to not correct in the AP that we need to look into? We are looking at, I think all of us are looking at rotational uh, deformity in terms of putting them uh, prone, looking at the thigh foot axis, etc. If there is a significant or there is a clear or a, you are worried about a rotational, you can do a CT rotational profile. In that particular situation, yes, you can correct the rotation, but I don't agree with the older notion that every tibial osteotomy you should do, include an external no, no. rotation. No, no, that is right. I agree with you. But, I mean, are the all there analysts is, looking into that rotational element when we I are correcting this? I think most of this? us, most of us do look at Or it just happens it, it goes beyond, inadvertently. It, it goes beyond the rotation as well. More than 30 years ago, Andriachi wrote a paper explaining this. It's the gate factors. There are many factors at play here. It's not just the rotation. Why do, you know, he found out this high adduction moment arm gate. An evaluation of an osteoarthritic patient is not complete unless you see him walking. You don't necessarily need a sophisticated gait lab. You can observe the dynamic varus or the lateral thrust component. And he found that you can train. We train our patients. You know, you can either correct it surgically by externally rotating or by overcorrecting the varus, or you can train them, take shorter steps by out towing and by knee flexion at heel strike. So the gate is important and there are many other factors, it's not just, it's multifactorial like you said. So you, you. you asked essentially, is there a component of rotation? No, no, I know that there is a component of yes. rotation. Are all the panelists looking into it when you are correcting or yes. it is just inadvertently gets corrected? No, no I think the answer is yes, we look for it. If there is a deformity, we will try to uh, factor. So you do a, a CT rotatory. Uh, CT scan. Not then, always. We will check it with clinical. Clinically, if there is no gross rotation, then uh, we would not. Okay. Uh, you agree, everyone? Yes, yes. Last question, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, good evening. I'm Dr. Neha Gurgati from Nagpur. Uh, my question is, uh, in cases of primary ACL reconstruction, uh, do you always uh, measure the uh, slope, posterior slope of the tibia and if at all it is more, do you correct it then and there or you restrict it to revision cases? And okay, I, yeah, so I think I'll take that question. The, the scenario here is that yes, the high posterior slope is definitely a modifiable cause to prevent ACL failure. If the slope is extremely high, more than 18 degrees, then in that very rare situation, one would do a primary slope correction along with the primary ACL, but for majority of cases, more than 95%, I think we restrict it only when your ACL reconstruction fails. 
for those odd cases in which the slope is high then we try and decrease our failure rate by adding an extra articular uh, t node assist kind of procedure dr modi last please yeah this is uh, for milin when you do a intraarticular osteotomy does your osteotomy go medial to the tuber tubal tubercle and the uh, tendon of patella or does it go lateral and second do you do the osteotomy and drilling in flex position of the knee to prevent injury to the posterior structures or do you do it in extension i'll take the second one first there was a study that showed that flexion doesn't protect the posterior neurovascular structures that there is an anterior branch that goes close to the bone and it tethers the popliteal artery very close to the tibia and it doesn't change flexion so i do not use flexion i know that you are a proponent and that's how you protect it i find it rather difficult to keep my orientation with the knee in flexion you know how to, you know how to do you know, angulate the osteotomy etc and the tcvo the vertical cut goes medial to the ligament and in the fdco it goes lateral to the patella and what part. what happens to the insertion of the acl so we do not breach the intracondylar part don't damage this thank you sir no more questions because we have run out of time and i thank the panel here for a wonderful session